Okay. There you go. All right. Well, it is noon, so we will get started since we have a, a tight program today. Uh, welcome everyone to today's Kelsey Museum virtual flash talk. Um, this is a for those of you who's new to who are new to this format. A flash talk is a brief presentation about a current research project, followed by a much more uh, lengthy Q and A. Um, our presentation should last about fifteen minutes, and then we'll have fifteen minutes for you, our audience, to ask questions. Um, you're welcome to use the fat flat. Oh my goodness! You're welcome to use the chat feature, and I will be checking that. Um, or you can uh, speak up, unmute yourselves, and uh, um, join in the conversation. Um, our speaker today is Kelsey Museum uh, Research Scientist, Dr. Richard Redding. Richard is also lead several archeological excavations uh, or projects in North Africa, the Middle East and Asia. And he is the chief research officer and uh, chief operating officer for the Ancient Egyptian Research Associates. Today, he's going to um, tell us all about the what life is like on a project in Egypt where he is right now. So welcome, Richard. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now, and then I'm gonna bring up the book here. Okay, there, that should do it. Hi, everybody. Uh, as I was telling Kathy when I we first talked about this, I had the brilliant idea I was gonna take zoom on my phone and walk around and show you life in the field all around the floor and where we live and then i suddenly realized a couple days ago well hold it it's six hours later here it's dark <laughs> so um it's kind of hard to show you what life's like here in the dark but we live in the in a villa here in egypt that we purchased uh, in 2009 with the laundry raised and here's the roof from my villa that's i'm standing on the roof here and guess what those are? That's the Great Pyramid and the Second Pyramid of Giza. The third one's in the background there. So this is our view from our roof. We're about a kilometer away from the base of the pyramids. I basically walk to work from here. In fact, I always walk home. Uh, and sometimes I walk around in, in, in during the week. And the, the roof of the villa is really quite nice. We have nice events up here and we use it for filming. So this is a background of a film I was in a little while ago. And this is a process of filming. So you can see A, how close we are to the pyramids and B, what great views we have. This is the front entrance of our villa. That's the main building straight in front of you. And to the left is a support building that houses six rooms. We can house about 18 people directly in the villa. We have 18 beds that we can keep people in. Uh, we might planning on building some more. In the background, you might see a building back there that's got scaffolding on it. That was started 30 years ago and they gave up about after two years and nothing's been done to it for 28 years. But it's just at the back of our property. We have a very large chunk of property with lots of gardens and uh, um, area in the back. We have about almost uh, five hectares of land out there. So it's really quite nice. That's the main building. It's uh, one, two, three stories tall. Uh, we've got a one story support building and you start to see some of the vegetation. Here again is the, uh, the building itself. The main steps go up there to the right and to the second floor. Uh, here's the side view. That's that support building with a series of six rooms, six rooms plus a shower and a uh, toilet there. Here's standing up on top of the porch, and you can look out, and that's the green gate that we come into, the green steel gate we come in and out of every day. Uh, we leave that to go to the field, and we come back in every day that way. Here's some of the gardens in the back. We have this nice little, I got the gazebo. It's a square gazebo. We have lots of plants back here. Uh, we've got bitter orange trees. We've got date palms. We've got... Uh, Oh, uh, bananas, uh, we have limes, uh, we have a lot of, uh, 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 um, of uh, fruit trees back here. Here's the side view again, and that's kind of a walkway up, and that's through our banana plantation there. You can see all the banana trees. We eat our own bananas, so we grow a little bit of our own food. We even have a plot of land in the back that we 
we till and harvest and plant on organically. Um, and uh, we've got sweet potatoes, potatoes, and various herbs. I grow a lot of pesto back there. I mean, or, uh, basil, sorry. And then I make pesto. Here's two typical rooms. These are inside the villa. Um, this is one of the large rooms upstairs. We house three people in this room. And that's one of the real small rooms with only one. In fact, that is the smallest room we have. And it's got a bed and a, and a desk in it, and that's about it. Uh, fortunately, it's a very light season. We don't have many people here this year. So these rooms are open. If anybody wants to visit, we have rooms open. We do have bathrooms. This is an old bathroom. This villa was built in the 20s. And when we bought it, we did a lot of renovation work on it. This is one of the, we did a complete renovation of the bathrooms and the electrical systems. This is our archive. This holds all of our records since 1989. This is all the paper copies of our records. So it's almost 30 years of records, now over 30 years, 32 years of records. Every piece of paper we've generated, every field form, every diary is all in here. It's also been Xerox. We have a duplicate copy in Boston. We have an office in Boston. We also have it all on uh, 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 disk. It's all been scanned also. And we have a large collection of maps. You can have a couple of map cases here. And if you look off to the left, you can see some uh, shelving units that also are used to house maps and drawings. So we have a big area. This is our archive and it's everything we've ever found. Every bit of data, every bit of piece of paper that said we've written. This is uh, our library and our lecture hall. Um, that's a large table there. We have a screen that's in the front of the room that we can drop and do PowerPoint presentations in here. <clears throat> we get about 40 people sitting comfortably in here for presentations, which we do quite frequently. We have talks and we do field schools here where we bring in Egyptians uh, from the Ministry of Antiquities and train them. And we'd have lectures in this uh, room and we have work for them to do. And they also work on the site. This is at the heart of our operation. This is the, uh, the computer lab. And most of the computers, I said, it's not a big error put away. But you can see the large black case in the back. That's our main server, which I can't remember how many gigaterabytes we've got in there. Uh, that's our main server and all our connectivity throughout the building, our wireless. Uh, we have, uh, again, all the computers in here. Uh, they're all connected. We have a really good wireless system, as you can see, because I'm talking to you on my wireless connection. Uh, although if we lose electricity, we're in real trouble. So this is the, uh, the heart of the things. We have an IT person, um, uh, Mohammed uh, Midu, better known as Midu. And he, believe it or not, he fends off between eight to 10,000 attempts to break into our system every day. We have a, a very, very good firewall. And he actually can go back and, and he's followed some people back uh, who've tried to break into our system. There's a place, a warehouse in Florida that has tried repeatedly to break into our server. And I don't know why, but that's where all of our data is stored. Everything is in that, on that server. Again, all the scans of all the reports, all our photographic records, everything. And it's all backed up. We have huge numbers of backup disks. So even if anything did happen, we'd be okay. This is kind of a work room that we use in working when we have lots of students. It's also an overflow area and we have lots of people for dinner. Uh, this is our main dining room. And there it is set. We, like I said, right now, I think we only have about 12 people here. So it's not a really full dining room. Um, so we put our food out on there, the counter over there. You can see that blue light is a fly killer. Uh, we're sitting there at dinner and all of a sudden you hear and it's a dead fly. Uh, and we eat uh, uh, breakfast in the morning at uh, 6 a.m. We have lunch at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and then we have dinner at 7 p.m. at night. There's our cook, Sabri, and this is our kitchen. So we have a rather large, elaborate stove there for him to cook on, and he's really quite good. He makes some excellent food. He's really good with seafood. So that's Sabre and our kitchen. We have an area just outside the kitchen, which is a public kitchen for people to make tea in. We have a microwave over there for people to eat up. And standing almost next to where I'm standing is a refrigerator for people to put 
their drinks and so on in that they want. And we also keep water in there, cheese and things for making sandwiches during the day if people get hungry. So that is pretty much that. We have a lot of outdoors. This is um, the one nearest the gate, uh, kind of a divan, benches with cushions on them, or in this case, rugs. And uh, this is where we gather in the morning before we go out. We usually have a, a meeting every morning at 6.45 before we get in our vehicles. Uh, on your right is a guy named Ben Brazley, who's an, an archeologist. Uh, the guy in the blue shirt with his arm cross is Saeed. Saeed is a, uh, uh, it's our rais. He controls the site. He organizes the workers and takes care of everything. He also oversees the villa in the in non season. The guy holding the tea in the galabe is Hamid. Hamid is kind of a guy just hangs out. He's there. He we pay him, but he's kind of the boab. He opens, answers the doors. He sweeps up, and we've got two other people that we employ for doing that same kind of thing. On the left is another archaeologist, Kathy Deru. She's married to Scott DeRue, who used to be the chair of the, or the dean of the business school. So this is where we gather in the morning at 7 a.m. And then we go out and get in our field vehicles. Here's our field vehicle. We actually have two of these now because it's a big enough crew. Um, and you, we've taken a little bit of equipment out there on this trip. We've got our cooler because every day when we go out there, we eat at 6 a.m. and then we don't eat again until 2. So about 10 to 10.30, we have a a second breakfast where people can have a little bit of bread and cheese and uh, maybe some fruit and have a cup of tea and coffee before we go out or before they come back. I can show you this. This is what we're working on this year. This is the back end, the back third of Menkares Valley Temple. And it was done in mud brick, both, oops, sorry. It was done basically in mud brick. Um, you can see one of the foundation stones in the foreground there. Menkere was just beginning to build his valley temple when he died. So his son said, well, we're all done. Let's finish it in mud brick and get out of here. So he finished it in mud brick and left. So the Menkere Valley Temple is mostly done in mud brick. In this area was found some of the most fabulous statuary of ancient Egypt of the Old Kingdom. The dyad, uh, the triads of Menkere Valley Temple. The dyad is on display at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's a beautiful, fantastic piece. I urge you if you go there to look at it. But you can see this is a huge temple. It goes from over here where these rocks are all the way over. You can see the men carrying dirt out to um, where we sieve it. Every bit of dirt we take out of here is sieved. We sieve everything. What's caught in the sieve, just to be sure, we take all that, put it in bags, and we wet sieve it. We use water to sieve it again, just to make sure we haven't missed anything. This is a, a tent that we keep near the site. <clears throat> that we use for sorting and initial processing. Here we are inside that tent. Uh, and you can see we've got tables up here. That's the material on the left. Is it's, it's a small material that's coming in. The animal bone, the uh, uh, charcoal, the small objects. Uh, the uh, okay, You can probably read the signs as well as I can. Lithics, the stone tools and so on that come in every day are all put there and then they're processed. And after they're processed and we get as much out of them here, we send them up to a lab we have up on the plateau. I'm not showing you that today. And this is a sorting tent we have nearby where all that wet sieve is gone through. Every bit of sieve material, they said the wet sieve is checked and checked again. They're finding small pieces of lithics, very, very microscopic almost pieces of lithics. They're finding broken seal impressions. They're finding tiny animal bones, fish, bird bones, and so on. All that becomes data. Our mantra is we're not searching for things, we're searching for data. And that's what we really try and do here. So I think that's it. I put together a little slideshow to show you what our life was like in the field. At the end of the day, we come back, we have lunch at two o'clock in the dining room. We then do work basically uh, with our data. We have as much, we usually have two or three hours of work every day to try and enter all of our data into the computers and get everything ready to go out the next day. So we're in the field working from 7 to about 1.30 every day. Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Does anybody have any questions about dig life at Giza? Uh, if, you, if you want to ask, just unmute yourselves and go ahead and speak up. 
I have a couple. I'm a non-archaeologist. Hi, Richard. It's nice to see you hi, across you the world. Hey. Yeah, how you doing? I'm good. Um, two questions. One, um, do you ever feel in danger? What's the danger kind of level? Just, uh, yeah. And then the second is, how is COVID affecting all you're doing? Uh, danger. We, we, I don't know. I've worked in Egypt since 1981, and I've been through the assassination of Sadat. I've been through the revolution. I've been through COVID. I've been through El Morrissey and then the, the, again, the counter-revolution by the military. And I've never really fe felt threatened. During the counter-move by the military uh, to uh, kind of end the, uh, end the Arab Spring and then the end, uh, we've never had any bit of trouble at all. We've continued to work. Uh, we've always had good relation with the people of Egypt. I can tell you a story that uh, during the revolution, and uh, before the military came in, uh, four brothers live across the street from us. Their, their house is off to the left as you're looking at the pyramids. And they came over all and they knocked on the door and they came in, we gave them through tea, we sat down. They said, look, we know who you are. We know what you do. If you have any problems, please let us know. Hmm. And these were men who are Salafis. They're the, the most conservative of all the religious sects in Egypt. So, you know, we've, we're well embedded. People like us. We do good, nice things. They like what we do. Uh, we're pleasant. We're not annoying. Uh, so people tend to leave us alone and, and we have no trouble. Mm. I have never felt threatened at all. There was, during when the military came in, there was a lot of firing, but we have high walls around, so we didn't really feel very insecure. Uh, so I've always felt fairly safe here. I've never really had any problems. COVID-wise, uh, in two, 2020, I, I left on March 23rd, just mm. before they shut down Cairo Airport. Uh, so I got home, and it it never it it never really affected us in the villa. Villa, uh, my partner Mark Lander, who's here, the uh, the the, uh, the president of Era, uh, he uh, got stuck here for five months. He didn't mm. get to leave until July. And so he had no trouble. They had no COVID. Uh, we, everybody stayed in the villa more or less and stayed safe. Uh, we exhibit, we're, we're fairly careful now. We have hand washing stations, require people to wear a mask in the vehicle and on the way to the site. Uh, everybody is vaccinated. We made sure of all of the people that work with us are vaccinated. Um, we paid to have them vaccinated and they all went out and got vaccinated quite happily. So, uh, yeah, I think we're pretty safe right now. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Hi, Richard. Lorene Sterner here. Hi, Lorene. You... I'm doing fine, thank you. And it looks like you are too. Yeah. Um, my question is, the people you hire, do you end up hiring the same people year after year to work on the dig? Is it, is it for them a seasonal thing or are they, they pretty much year round? Um, it's for they're, who, we hire, who we hire mostly from the village of Abu Sir. And Abu Sir is about half an hour south of here where there's the, the solar pyramids at Abu Sir. They're almost all experienced workmen. They've worked archaeological projects up and down the, the, uh, uh, the uh, area of the Nile, the Northern Nile. So they're all very experienced. They know what to do. It's fairly relaxing work for them. We're, we don't work them that hard. Um, they enjoy it. Um, I think you saw the, uh, the uh, advertisement for this where the guys were singing. I don't remember. And they break out into song all the time. Um, we pay them fairly well. Um, they leave here, they go home, and they do agricultural work in the afternoon and evening, uh, which is, this is just like nice free money for them. Um, it's hard to get paying jobs for some people. So yeah, we do hire the same people on over. We have a staff in the villa, as I mentioned, um, Saeed the Reyes, who is also uh, uh, kind of oversees the villa, manages the villa. We have a permanent accountant here who's here all the time. Um, we have then a, the cook who is seasonal, uh, Sabri. Um, then we have four employees that are here all the time. 
who maintain the villa. We have a woman who does kind of maid work year round at the villa, keeping it clean. And then when we are all here, she brings on a couple of people to help. Uh, and everybody seems to be happy working here. We've never had any complaints. Uh, and I think everybody finds us fairly amusing. So <laughs> to be quite frank. Did I answer all Lorraine? Yes, you did. Thank you. All right, Lorraine. We have a question in the chat from Mallory Bauer. Uh, what do you all do for entertainment or fun when you're not excavating? Well, you should say, you should come here for dinner sometime. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we get into a lot of fairly nuanced discussions of archaeology and method and theory and so on. But mostly uh, people uh, sit and talk. We, uh, uh, we used to, when we were a bigger crowd, we'll, sometimes we'll have a party or two. Uh, most people go to bed fairly early by nine o'clock because we're up at five. I get up at five. Uh, and uh, you know, I get up at five and take a quick shower. And then I've got work to do to prepare for the day. As I said, we have breakfast at six and we leave at seven. So um, not a lot of time. On Friday, which is our day off, um, usually people go to the gym, work out. They do maintenance activities for themselves. They watch, uh, they binge watch things on Netflix. Um, so, you know, we've got good Wi-Fi here so we can really keep up on the latest things from Netflix. Um, you know, we've had card games here uh, when bigger crowds. Um, I said, we sometimes have had evening parties on Thursday and, and uh, Friday, uh, but this is a smaller group. Most people just kind of just tired and we, just crash on our day off. And today, I took a couple of neophytes that are here for the first time or the second time. Uh, we went to visit some sites and did a site tour today. So on my day off, I did a busman's holiday and went to, to some sites. Tomorrow morning, we get up and start working again, Saturday morning. Thank you. Do we have any any other questions for Richard? Hmm. I can point the camera down. This, I'm in my room. I have a room in the support building. That's my bed. It's uh, 2.7 meters by 2.7 meters. So it's about what? So it's about six by six. I've got a little desk folding table here as a desk. I've got my my bookshelf, which I keep all my clothes and my books and various things on. And uh, there's my bed. I got a fan in here because there's no air conditioning. Uh, and I've got a window here I'm looking out right now. So this is where I live. All right, we have a, another comment in the chat. Hi, Richard, Nigel Pollard. We worked together at uh, Keith decades ago. Wow. Oh, Nigel, <laughs> yes. God. All right, Nigel, hi. <laughs> it's been a while. He says, when I was a graduate student, no Netflix. I remember. <laughs> Kathy, are you talking or am I losing you? No, no, I'm not talking. You haven't lost me. I'm right here. We got the call to prayer going on here. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can hear it in the background. Yeah. The Any sunset. final questions from our audience? Sue Ashford says, super interesting to get this eye view into the op operate an operating archaeological site. Yeah. Absolutely. Somebody's coming in very late. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Uh, if you, have anything, you, can, you can get my email from, uh, from the uh, Kelsey website. Send me an email if you'd like. I'm always happy to respond. Vereen has one more question. It says, I've heard some excavations have problems with battery life and dust on site. Have you had this? Oh, dust on site. Yeah, we have constant. Uh, I have to buy a new camera lens about every two years. 
just they just freeze up and quit working. We have lots of dust on site. Battery life, we don't have too much trouble with. Um, I've got a field computer and I've got a computer that I keep in the house. And I, my field computer lasts about two years. I usually get something inexpensive or like a tablet uh, because it, it just gets destroyed out there. It's a, I'm recording data on it in the lab and there's data, there's heat, there's dust, there's, you know, what can I tell you? Last, in 2023, when I said I was in 2020, 2020, sorry, when I was here, we had the worst rainstorms they've had in 20 or 30 years here. And the roof of our lab actually collapsed, actually collapsed and we had a, our lab, part of our lab flooded with water. Fortunately, none of it was in an area that had delicate material. Uh, but it was my area, so you know, my computer got flooded. All my collections got flooded. It took a long time to dry out. We had to put a new roof on. So, is the lab where you spend most of your time on site? Yeah, the lab is. Uh, I didn't bring a picture of it. There's, I published pictures in the past. It looks like a dump. Um, it's behind the Great Pyramid. It's about a. It's about a kilometer, almost about a mile from the site to the lab. It's among the mastabas that are west of the Great Pyramid. Um, so it's a actually the old German dig house that was here. And uh, we use that as our lab. It's a fairly large structure with a number of rooms in it. Uh, but it's really decrepit on the outside. Inside, we've got it very comfortable. It's like much of the housing in Egypt it looks terrible on the outside. But the inside looks nice. So yeah, we that's where we actually go into the detailed analysis. Like the lithics people, the people working with stone tools come out, they bring their scales, they bring all their equipment, their calipers. They sit there and they measure and photograph and weigh all the material, make drawings of it. Um, it's where I work with uh, quite frequently doing the fine identification of all the animal bone. We have several big microscopes in there that we use to identify the plant remains. Um, it's, we have other microscopes for looking at the seal impressions. It's where a lot of the final ceramics are done, photographed, drawn, uh, and glued back together. So it's really kind of where the fine work is done. There are the two comments in the chat. One is thank from Rowena Baker. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have never been on an excavation. Very interesting to see behind the scenes. And then another question from Loreen, where are your finds stored after the season ends? Um, fortunately, our lab, we are allowed to store everything in our lab. First of all, as I said, we are really, we really like garbage and we really work mostly in areas where there is um, no nice finds. <laughs> we, we don't get beautiful objects. We don't get, uh, uh, we don't get uh, uh, museum pieces. We get crap. And so they're not really interested in it. So we've got all of our crap, so to speak, in our lab. And we've stored it there since going back to 1989. Uh, so it's all in there. Everything we've excavated you know, all over the Giza Plateau since 1989. All in there stored, cataloged, labeled. Uh, and uh, if anybody wants to come in the future and look at it, it's all there. Um, again, people come in and they, they, the Egyptian government will come in, their representatives, the inspectors, and say, have you got anything nice? And we'll show them our nicest things. And I go, geez, get rid of it. You know, what do we want this for? Uh, anyway, it's not the kind of stuff that they want for museums. So it's not the kind of stuff that they really see as precious. The only thing we've ever had taken was in our site, at our main site, the Hitchikarab site, there's a bunch of late period burials. And we did find some jewelry in those late period burials. And that was all taken. And late period, I mean, the settlement we're dealing with is Old Kingdom. It's about 2400 BC, 2450 BC. Those late period burials were on seven or 800 BC, 900 BC. So it's, it's, it's intrusive barrels plunked down into our site. So it, it's all really meaningless to us in terms of our greater mission. Uh, but that's the only thing that the government has ever taken from our lab to put into storage in a secure lab where the nice stuff is kept.
Green says, I bet that's a major trove of boxes. I think about the lab. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, 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 uh, uh, yeah. And it's hard to get good cardboard boxes here. That's another problem, major. So. All right, any final questions? It is 1230 now, so. Um, Hi, Mary, sorry you got in late. <laughs> anyway. All right, well, thank you so much, Richard. This was fascinating. I really appreciate it. And thank you all to our, our visitors here who have come in on their lunchtime to, um, to listen. And for those of you who are interested, our next flash talk will be December 3rd at noon, uh, where uh, Dr. Uh, Irene Sotomarin is going to talk about uh, her research on um, the coins in the Kelsey Museum. So thank you again, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.